Chapter 4 Nancy's Impersonation I never should have given you girls that assignment, Nancy said. If something has happened to George, I can't forgive myself. Bess was in tears. She and George had many little misunderstandings and sometimes found fault with each other, but the two girls were very close. The thought that George might be a prisoner was almost too much for Bess. We must find her, she said, a catch in her voice. If we don't get a lead on George in a few minutes, we'll tell the police. Nancy agreed. Let's go back to the tea room and find out from Mrs. Hempstead where Mr. Seaman lives. Then we'll go right to his house. As the girls hurried along, Nancy added, Bess, I'd like to keep my identity here a secret. Do you remember the play I was in where I took the part of the shy girl with the high-pitched voice named Irene Innsbruck? I'll never forget it, said Bess. Well, I'm going to become Irene while I'm doing my sleuthing here, Nancy announced. When the girls reached the tea room, it was about to close. Mrs. Hempstead still sat in her rocker, swaying gently back and forth and humming a hymn. Despite the gravity of the situation, Bess could hardly keep her face straight as Nancy introduced herself in a voice pitched almost an octave higher than her normal one. Then she asked, I understand you know most everyone in town. Could you tell me where Mr. Seaman lives? Mrs. Hempstead leaned forward and gave a little chuckle. Are you his girlfriend? she asked, as if she were latching onto a possible bit of gossip. Nancy did not have a chance to answer. Mrs. Hempstead, presuming this was the case, prattled on. Nice man, Mr. Seaman. Reliable like, she winked. That's the kind of man a girl ought to have for a husband. In the pause that followed, Bess felt she should say something to carry on the pretense, so she remarked, Mr. Seaman really ought to reduce, though. Irene prefers thin men. Mrs. Hempstead laughed aloud and turned to Nancy. After you're married to him, you can put him on a diet, she said, giving Nancy another wink. Nancy, playing the game, laughed too. Right now, I'm only interested in learning where his house is. He never said. Well, now, I can't tell you that, the old lady said. It's somewhere out of town, but he never told me where it is. Nancy showed her disappointment. She changed the subject abruptly. Mrs. Hempstead, do you think I would like it here in Deep River? I don't see why not. I've lived here all my life, and look at me. Hail and hearty yet. The impersonator acted unconvinced. I've heard some queer things have happened in this town, she said. Oh, it's not bad, Mrs. Hempstead shrugged. Of course. There were a few moments of silence. Then the old woman brightened, sat up straight, and rocked back and forth furiously. Of course, there's the castle. Too bad it was abandoned. It was once a beautiful place. The show place of Deep River 50 years ago. Who owned it? Nancy queried in her Irene high-pitched voice, which almost matched the tone of Mrs. Hempstead. Some foreigners built it and lived there until it became haunted, Mrs. Hempstead answered. Haunted? Bess repeated. I'll say it was, Mrs. Hempstead replied. The folks never finished building the castle. It was to have another turret and finally abandoned it. There was one tragedy after another. A child drowned in the moat. A man got hoisted on the drawbridge and was crushed. Oh, please, said Bess. Don't tell us any more. Mrs. Hempstead was not to be stopped. She said that no one had lived in the castle for many years, but the taxes on it were paid by someone living in Europe. So the town can't do anything with the place. The county can't do anything with it either, 
the state police look it over once in a while to see that everything is in order out there. Mrs. Hempstead suddenly pointed to an ancient framed map hanging on the wall. Look at that, she directed. If you'll look close, you'll see that Deep River Valley was originally called Moonstone Valley. Nobody seems to know why the name was changed. I guess the people who lived in the castle knew this and liked the name because they called their place Moonstone Castle. At this bit of information, Nancy and Bess looked at each other. This was the second time in two days that Moonstones had come to their attention. Was there any connection between Moonstone Castle and the gem which had been sent so mysteriously to Nancy? Speaking of queer things, Mrs. Hempstead said reminiscently, There's the case of Mrs. Horton. Nancy and Bess could hardly conceal their excitement. Horton? Nancy repeated. Yes, said Mrs. Hempstead. Her place was quite far out of town. She never was sociable, so folks around here didn't know her very well. She never mingled much, and after her son and daughter-in-law died, nobody ever saw or heard from her again until just before her death. What happened to her? asked Nancy. Well, it was like this, Mrs. Hempstead related. Just at the time her son died, a couple of servants she had went off suddenly, and a new couple came there. After that, food was always delivered to the house, but the money for it was left outside. The tradespeople who went out there never saw anybody. Talk got around that Mrs. Horton had become queer. Personally, I don't know who was the queerest. Mrs. Horton or those servants she had. Why, do you know, at the time of her last illness, they actually called in an out-of-town doctor? And when she died, the servant sent for an out-of-town undertaker? And what was even worse, the funeral was private. Not a soul in this town knew about it until it was over. Nancy and Bess did not comment. Numerous questions raced through their minds. Bess, impulsively, suddenly blurted out, What happened to the little grandchild who was staying with Mrs. Horton? The instant she had asked the question, Bess was sorry. To her and Nancy's relief, however, the old lady did not seem to think the question out of order. Little grandchild, she remarked. If Mrs. Horton's son had a little child, nobody around here knew it. The woman chuckled. You can bet your life if any child was out there, I would have heard about it. The two girls made no comment, for at that moment, Mrs. Hempstead's daughter came into the room. Mother, she said, it's time for bed. You've had quite a day. Nancy and Bess left at once. They realized they should continue their search for George. When they reached the street, they turned in the direction where they had seen police headquarters. Their hearts and minds full of worry, the two girls hurried along in silence. As they passed a well-lighted soda shop, crowded with young people, they suddenly heard a familiar whistle. George was signaling to them from inside the shop. Oh, thank goodness, said Bess in relief. Nancy felt that a great weight had been lifted from her as she and Bess hurried inside. You've given us the worst scare of our lives. What? Bess started to scold her cousin. I was just going to phone the tea room to tell you where I was when I saw you coming, George told the girls. Come sit down with me while I finish eating and I'll tell you everything that happened. They listened attentively to her account of trailing Mr. Seaman and his going off in a car driven by a woman. I started back to town. Halfway here, I was sure a man was trailing me. By this time, it was too dark to see him very well, but he wasn't the man I followed from the brass kettle, 
What did he look like? Bess asked. He was very thin. In fact, I think he was the same man who was following you in River Heights, Nancy, said George. Suddenly, she looked out the window and cried, There he goes now! Look! Nancy and Bess dashed to the window as the man hurried up the street. That man looks familiar to me, Nancy said excitedly. End of chapter four. <laughs>